Hey, uh, thank you very much, Andy. It's first of all, it's my pleasure to introduce you <laughs> and the panel. Um, uh, uh, the uh, panel on R and D strategies and trends with uh, focus on the big I innovation. Um, and and as you uh, already know, we have an impressive uh, panel of uh, R and D heads who have both big pharma and biotech experience. And so it really promises to be a wide ranging discussion. The panelists themselves are Andy Klump uh, from Takeda, Dave Reese from Amgen, Hal Barron from GSK, uh, Matai Mammon from Janssen. Uh, and uh, as alluded to, it'll be moderated by the infamous Martin Mackay. Uh, he's a co-founder of Rally Bio uh, and also previously head of R&D at uh, Alexion. We're really looking forward to uh, an exciting discussion. So Martin, please take it away. Oh, many thanks indeed, Deval, for that uh, very kind introduction. This is always an exciting panel. And uh, as you introduced everybody, I won't spend time on that, but just to say that Andy and Matai are, are old hands at this. They are, uh, they're used to the, the roller coaster we're gonna go through in the next 40 minutes. And many thanks to David and Hal for volunteering as uh, two rookies, uh, yeah. as it were, uh, on the panel. Not rookies in the world of R&D, obviously, but I'm truly delighted. And I just wanted to pause for a second and, and really say to Karun and Andy, well done. You, ha you have pulled this meeting off. I think everybody wondered, you know, could it be done in this format? Well, I've, I've attended most of the panels and they've been terrific. And the, the fireside chats I found enthralling. And, and whilst I miss you all, uh, I miss the, the, the reception that follows this and the dinner afterwards, I actually think the content is as good, if not better, than we've ever had at this meeting. So well done to everybody, all the panelists, the fireside chats, truly terrific. And so then, uh, I've got some questions lined up here. As folks know, I, I try to make this as interactive as possible, uh, even between the panel and with the audience. It'll be slightly more of a challenge with the audience this time, but I think uh, there'll be a, a number of things bouncing off uh, you folks, and that will be great. I will attempt to moderate. Um, at the risk of stating the obvious, COVID has been a theme throughout it, and it would be remiss of me if I didn't ask some questions, particularly with this panel of R&D heads. And actually, I have two questions for you, but I'm going to take them in turn. Uh, I'll tell you them both now, but I'd just like you to answer the first one. And the first one is, you know, just uh, what you're doing around uh, COVID and, uh, you know, what's happening in your own companies. And also, really importantly, this was a point that Hal brought out when they were preparing for this, how much you're collaborating as a group. My second question then, and as I say, I'll take it in turn, will be uh, to, to go into what impact has it had on your other programs? and in R&D in general, so two separate questions. So let's go with the first one, which is, you know, what are you doing in this COVID uh, world about COVID? And, um, uh, and, and I'm gonna start with you, David, throw you, you know, right into the deep end, David. Sure, well, I'll try to swim and uh, it, these are uh, big shoes to fill. Uh, so I, I would say, you know, we're doing a, a number of things against COVID uh, 19, as are, of course, all of the panelists here, uh, in addition to participation in the, you know, broader efforts across industry and in partnership with government and academia, uh, you know, I'd call out a few things. Uh, our subsidiary Decode, and Gen Decode Genetics in Iceland uh, has published uh, a couple very important manuscripts in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, detailing the initial course of the epidemic uh, in Iceland, and then just a few days ago, the antibody response uh, of patients. Uh, you know, we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to the Icelandic patients uh, who have participated in this uh, and are continuing to do so on a longitudinal basis. Uh, so this will actually provide some of the best longitudinal data where we have essentially complete follow-up uh, on patients uh, in the island. Uh, in addition, uh, we are working on uh, potential neutralizing antibodies as are uh, you know, other panelists, uh, companies here. Uh, and then finally, we are studying immunomodulatory agents. So 
uh, you know, a, across the, the breadth of uh, COVID-19, you know, feel comfortable and, and quite happy with our contribution. This is an all hands on deck moment. Uh, and uh, I think we all feel that this is nothing that uh, a single company, organization, government is going to solve. We're all in it together. Uh, and much of this has to be viewed as a public good. Oh, very, very good, um, David. Thank you. How? Well, how, how is it going at GlaxoSmithKline? Going terrifically. Thanks for asking. Um, our approach for COVID really is, is um, taking a th three different approaches to seeing how we can provide solutions. Um, underlying these three uh, solutions, let me back up and say that, you know, such an unprecedented uh, experience. And we've really took two philosophies. One is that, you know, we have to have multiple shots on golf from multiple companies because if we rely on any one approach, it may or may not work and we need backup plans. So we were focused on trying to figure out where we could add our unique value as one. Um, and that because each company probably has expertise in certain pieces, we believe that the collaboration was going to be key and you can see that through our program. So the first um, area was vaccines and uh, we have numerous collaborations, most um, Notable is one with Sanofi, where we uh, have uh, begin the vaccine testing uh, quite soon, <clears throat> and we um, are providing for that collaboration uh, our adjuvant, which is a very special adjuvant for the pandemic, uh, which allows the antigen to be more immunogenic or more likely reduce the the dose of the protein. So that um, when you think about the biggest problem that we thought we'd be facing was, in addition to showing efficacy, is having be able to do manufacturing at scale, so that reducing the dose of the uh, of the protein by maybe even fivefold, possibly tenfold, you could consider that to be the same fold increase in number of patients you can reach for the same manufacturing. So that was something that we thought was very unique to GSK and, and, and something we wanted to ensure was adopted by anybody developing an engine uh, based uh, uh, approach. And so we have six or seven other collaborations using our pandemic engine. The second approach is. Um, was early on when we started seeing this inflammatory syndrome, this um, cytokine-like storm. And, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, excitement about potential for IL-6 being critical to that. But, but the truth was many cytokines were elevated. And now I think we realize that based on the steroid data and based on the IL-6 data, that there's probably a need to quiet the immune system by targeting more than one cytokine. And the, the approach we took was to inhibit an animal using an antibody to inhibit a protein called GMCSF, which is the protein we think is most responsible for the monocyte macrophage activation that we think might be uh, fundamental and, and as well as a neutrophil. So we think this by reducing multiple cytokines may potentially be an option for patients should the trials bear out for this more acute end stage sort of inflammatory situation. And the third is, um, as David mentioned, we're, we're developing an antibody monoclonal uh, for neutralizing the virus with a company called Veer, collaboration that um, we're very excited about. And this monoclonal we think is unique in the sense that it's identified from people, and maybe we'll get back to why that's so important, but from people who uh, recovered from SARS. And we were looking for an epitope that was conserved in SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2, so that if the virus became um, mutated over time, that we would potentially hopefully have an antibody that would be effective despite all the mutations. So that, that's our three approaches. Marvelous, Hal. And it's, you know, it's interesting from a, you know, from a almost political point of view that uh, past leaders in GSK, people that went before you are still at the sharp end of this pandemic and thinking particularly about Monsef and Patrick Valance. I mean, they're in, I would rather be in your position than theirs, I must say. Yeah, I think your, your point about the sharp end might be absolutely correct. Very good. Thank you. Matai, uh, Janssen, J&J, &J, please tell me. Sure. So, you know, um, we considered where we were going to be able to best contribute. Um, there are two areas. We have a long history in immunology and, uh, you know, many, many ways of approaching immunomodulators. Um, and then there's, of course, our vaccine platform. So first on the immunomodulatory side, there was an observation by Verily um, Andy Conrad and the team there verily pretty early on that there seemed uh, no correlation between uh, viral load or level of iremia um, estimated in a particular way and symptomology. So we knew that the we know still that the immune system um, plays some important role in both symptomology and ultimately maybe really bad outcomes. 
And so exactly how to approach that is, uh, is, is not clear even to this day. Uh, I remember Hal and I had a quick phone call about that. We could equally rationalize activating or inactivating certain pathways. And uh, it's interesting, but we've, we've taken the lead from uh, certain registry data and, um, and other, other data that we had access to and are making several attempts on the immunomodulatory side. Probably um, better known right now from, from some of the media is what we're doing on the vaccine side. We have a vaccine platform that is ad 26 that um, has proven mm -hmm. quite useful for different vaccines, including uh, Zika and Ebola. We have a major attempt in, in uh, both RSV and HIV. So it's been in a lot of patients um, and it works in a, in a reliable way. It's stored easily. It has a good mm. uh, for one dose effect. It has all that. So it's convenient. And we spent time there. We didn't jump right in. You know, we didn't jump right in with the spike protein, but rather we made uh, numerous variants with a collaborator, Dan Baruch at Harvard, at the Bethesda Deaconess. And we went through a selection process and we whittled down to a couple of major candidates and then selected one in the June timeframe. And then we went like mad to get this thing in the clinic. We have a special cell line that can grow ad 26 at very high volumes. And so we use that and we entered the clinic on July 21st and we're, you know, waiting for all our data to read out from that phase one, two, a study to make decisions on how, how to best whether to and how to best go forward into phase three. But I'm feeling really good about where we are. Very good, Matai. Thank you. Um, terrific, terrific uh, work going on there. Uh, Andy at, at Takeda. Yeah, so Martin, maybe just to talk thematically about how we approach this, which was how could we enable the ecosystem and how could we work together to achieve common shared goals? You know, we, we reasoned at the very beginning, as everybody on this panel feels, that this wasn't a business interest. This was a mandate that yeah. we had to step up and do what we could. And so everything that we've done along the way has been collaborative. And, you know, examples, we're a vaccine company, but we don't have the history that GSK does. We don't have the a, a differentiating platform like J&J. &J. And so what we decided to do was step up our manufacturing capabilities, and we'll do distribution in Japan and Asia, partnered with other companies. Um, we've got four or five repurposed molecules um, good mechanistic rationale. And so actually David, Amgen, Takeda, a couple of other companies are involved now in a series of platform studies, really a novel way of working um, in this space. Uh, one of our capabilities is plasma, you know, this very arcane technology, but complex to purify hyperimmune globulin. And so we're doing that with other plasma companies and we'll be stepping up a study with the NIAID starting shortly Hopefully at the tail end, it will look different than what we're seeing with plasma in terms of some of the background noise. Um, and then lastly, working with uh, Novartis and Gilead, Schrodinger, uh, Mushi, and other companies in the research space. And we're not a virology company, but our scientists were so motivated to leverage some of the libraries and capabilities that we've had that we've started. You know, it doesn't take a lot to start a drug discovery program. We've really made great progress and now thinking about next steps of how we can continue to work together, not just to ensure that we're solving COVID-19, but to ensure that we're ready for the next pandemic. No, it makes great sense, Andy. And, and you've all mentioned a collaboration and um, I, I heard uh, from Matai and Hal, you know, you had a telephone call about this. I'm going to come back to Andy uh, to ask a question on it. But I mean, just tell, tell the folks that are listening, yeah. How did that call start, Hal, and what well, made you think of starting it, and, and what was Matai's reaction? How did that go? Well, the, I mean, these guys can add to it, but it was an early March day, so early in the process. For those of us in Boston, it was typically cold, gray, and snowy uh, <laughs> outside. It was a Sunday morning, and a handful of us got on the phone because we, we just were going in all different directions. And... You know, it was like we all had this epiphany that we're all going through the same thing. We're all trying to do something good. Let's let's just work together. And, you know, something that many of us have said, and actually I've had this great opportunity to work with Matai for a long time, how on and off I've really just, you know, dive deep in a relationship with David over this COVID epidemic. These are really good people. 
and yeah, we, we're competitors and we want to beat each other when it comes sure. to, to winning. But I think we all share a very common mindset and a common goal. And, you know, the trust and the relationships that we have and we've developed have really enabled a lot of this effective partnership. Yeah. Is that how you felt, Hal? Yeah. I mean, I think Andy said it perfectly. I think I think it was just such a shock to the system to think about not only how big the problem was, but how much responsibility we all had for solving it. And um, it was sort of a unique situation where you feel um, the time pressure, uh, the content knowledge pressure, just a lot of different pressures. And so I think all of our instincts were, who can we call to help? And so we leverage our relationships. You know, we, I, I you know, feel very close to Matai and, and to Andy and to many people in the, in the pharma industry. And it was just wonderful to just bounce ideas off Matai. And, you know, he said, you know, it's funny you called because I just talked to Andy earlier. We're setting up a group. And so everybody was pretty much thinking the same thing. I'll tell one quick story just in the Please. spirit of collaboration that, that I think was um, emblematic, really, of everything everyone's doing. But one day I got a text from Roger Perlmutter saying, do you have a few minutes to talk about COVID? And so, of course, I said, sure. And I don't know, within a half an hour, we were talking. And he, he, he let me know about a screen they were doing uh, on, a, on a pathway to class that they were excited about. And they had some control molecules. And one of them was a control molecule that we own, that we had actually in, been in clinical development. And he said, you know, the funny thing about the screen is our molecule didn't really work that well, but yours did. And I just wanted to call you to let you know, we'd be happy to send you the data, do anything to help. We hope that it solves the pandemic and just wanted you to know. And the idea that, you know, companies are and heads of RDs are talking about sharing data and, and doing things without any lawyers and IP and whatnot, it was just, it was a very, we actually had known about some of this data, but, but the point was really the, the collaborative spirit that I think everybody that I've interacted with in the farm industry um, has, has had since this broke out. You know, on, on the data, if I don't, if you don't mind, Martin, on, on, oh, the, on the data sharing piece, we had Ann Hetherington in the previous talk, talk yeah. about effort. I wonder, Matai, because Matai has really stepped up in a space that's hyper-competitive <clears throat> in vaccines, to help to really drive information and data sharing. I don't know, Matai, if you want to comment a bit about that. I think it's been quite impressive. Oh. Yeah. You're pulling a Chris Viebacher. You're on mute. Oh, sorry. At least if you, yeah. I was saying that on the vaccine side, even if you um, are using different platforms, if you're using a similar protein, there is a logic for um, a commonality of an immune correlate for efficacy. So there's no question that it's useful to share data and maybe share other information. And at first it was challenging, but it, in recent times, it's been quite satisfying to see the company step forward, talk about their experiences with the uh, regulators, choice of endpoints, um, you know, where they are with uh, how they think about recruiting and designing the study. It's been wonderful. And then just, you know, the, the comment maybe that, that expands on that a bit is um, th there's no question that collaboration and sharing is a good thing across the industry where you are fiercely competitive about intellectual property, but there's so much that's not about that that is useful to, to get together. So the silver lining of COVID-19, of the group that Andy catalyzed and put together and led, um, all of this is that it's created trust relationships and deepened trust relationships that already existed among a whole bunch of people. Yes. Like not just big pharmaceutical companies, but a whole bunch of people, whoever was interested in, in contributing. And that bodes well for the future. There's no doubt. Yes, Another important piece here, Martin, was the group getting together. There was the real-time data sharing aspect, but also asking the question, where are the gaps? What's not being done that this group can potentially uniquely contribute? Uh, and then as the group gelled, it also became a vehicle to interact with government, for example, uh, the FDA, uh, now Operation Warp Speed, uh, NIH Active, uh, and provide a sort of unified voice, uh, point of view, all of which was in service of efficiency. Uh, and I'm certain that the, the relationships have been, which have been quite intense. I, I mean, I've spent more time with the folks on this panel almost in my own family uh, over the last four or five months. Uh, and uh, you know, those rela re relationships will be enduring. Absolutely. And it doesn't surprise me, you know, knowing you guys and, and knowing the way you work, I think there's sometimes a thought abroad, which is you're all at each other's throats, but 
I've known uh, people in this industry for long enough, and particularly at a time like this, where folks really get together and solve the problem. And, you know, Roy spoke about the power of science coming through here, so I'm delighted. Um, now, now that I'm in a you know tiny company, we Andy and I had a discussion a few weeks ago, and I was saying, you know, we hardly missed a beat in a small organization. We're preclinical. All our work is done outside with collaborators, and, and they kept their doors open. So for us, it's been you know just more of the same. But for you folks, you know, running large development programs, what's that been like, Matai? I think the, on the development side, it, it varied depending on the part of the portfolio or the, the indication that we're talking about. It, I mean, overall, we, we, we treated each um, trial as special. You know, what were we able to do to keep it going, to keep it moving? Um, and in some areas, we were remarkably successful. In fact, in some areas, I would even say we may have sped it up. Um, <laughs> and then in other areas where, for example, in our pulmonary hypertension space, they're all pulmonologists, and the pulmonologists were the first to be pulled off whatever they were doing and asked to treat the pulmonary disease of, of COVID-19. So they were that was tough. And certain very potent immunomodulators that had unknown activity, really those were a little tough. But if you look at oncology, if you look across the board in our cardiovascular space, it, it, it was remarkably good. We used tactics. We did special things. Um, you know, we got drug to patients in non-standard ways. We did some remote monitoring, for example, with our antidepressant, which is supposed to be delivered uh, in, an, in an observed facility. We yes. had rapid regulatory review of, a, of an iPad-based home monitoring system, which worked out and kept people on drug. So we pulled out all the stops, and in, in most places, we were successful keeping things going. Very good. What about at GSK, Hal? You know, I don't have much to add from what Matai said. I think um, you you basically are looking for creative solutions. Um, and some of those solutions are going to be solutions that stay with us uh, because they're creative and useful and happen to solve this problem, but probably should have been in place before, just the incentive and the push and whatnot wasn't there. So I think, you know, keeping the patient at the center of of the clinical trial is always something all of us are trying to do. And this just, I think, uh, further accentuated the need to do that. So uh, I won't go into any specifics, but but we had many challenges, most of which came as well with uh, creative ideas, like Matai mentioned. You make a great point about many of these things will stay with us now, Hal, and maybe it's things we should have been doing, you know, previously. Um, what about uh, uh, Jen, David? Yeah, you know, to me, the, I, I think of this in a couple big categories. First is the virtualization of clinical trials, you know, whether it is a telemedicine visit, directly shipping investigational product to a patient instead of having them come to a site, uh, virtual investigator meetings, site initiations, centralized monitoring. All of those things were trends pre-COVID, covid greatly accelerated it. And I think we've learned that many of these things, each one of which might be fairly trivial, but when you put a dozen or 20 of them together, it can have a dramatic impact on trial efficiency. Uh, and I would also say in the democratization uh, of trials, uh, a patient who's 300 miles from an investigational site may have an insurmountable barrier to participating if they have to do weekly trial visits. If they only have to come every couple months, that may be a game changer. And so what do we retain from that uh, that really uh, allows a broadened reach going forward? Shame on us if we don't permit that to happen. Yes, indeed. I'm gonna move us off um, COVID, but I want to give you a chance, Andy, just to, to, just to close out on the, the impact that it's had in your organization. Then we're gonna move on. I mean, I won't add, there's not much to add. We're all going to say the same thing. I'll just emphasize and double click on what David just said, which is we now have an opportunity to use this as a forcing function to change how we behave and to improve efficiency. We, we just get so caught up in, in inertia and legacy ways of working. And so much of what we do is just intrinsically inefficient. And I think this is a chance. We just can't, can't lose the opportunity. Absolutely. So I'm going to move us off um, COVID. Thank you for that. Really great insights in terms of the fighting the virus, but also the impact on your organization. I'd like to move to my 
question that I ask every year, and it's, I must confess it's my favourite question. Uh, it usually gets some really good discussion, and it's about what are you most excited about, um, you know, in your organisation? Just, just take the pandemic aside for the moment. What's going on, modalities, technologies? I think we may even have some questions from the audience. So let's go around and ask that, and then we'll, we'll go to the audience. So Hal at GSK, what are you most excited about? Well, there's quite a few things. I'll, um, I'll just pick one, uh, combine a few things into one, which is, um, and, and maybe I'm uh, reaching to some of you on the choir here, but I think that what we find most exciting is to make this, to use Andy's words, inherently inefficient system more efficient. And the problem that we're trying to tackle is the 90% failure rate of, of, of potential drugs entering the clinic that, that come out. And, we tried to simplify that problem and ask what is the, of course there's many drivers for that, but what is the biggest one? And we arrived at being that the targets that we choose are perfect for mice and not very good for humans. I mean, I'm oversimplifying. And, and, and so we said, okay, well, what are you gonna do about that? And, and we've tried to make the human the model organism. Uh, and by that, I mean, using data to the extent possible from humans to really figure out what, uh, what is wrong with a patient with a given disease? What's the pathophysiologic process? What are the, therefore, the targets that need to be modulated? And we're basically focused uh, on using human genetics as well as functional genomics. I mean, so we now have with 23andMe and UK Biobank and FinGen and Open Targets and a couple other things that we'll announce soon, the, one of the largest, if not the largest, human genetics databases, but, but 90 plus percent of these GWAS associations, sometimes very strong, we don't really know what's in the causal pathway, what's confounded by things being in LD or what might be um, not in an intragenic region. So you don't even know what gene it's actually affecting. You don't really understand exactly what the association, what's driving the association. And of course, without knowing that, there's no way to really be effective at, at, at developing medicines or finding the target. So this whole field of functional genomics to be very specific about what I'm most excited about, the ability to do gene-gene interaction maps in a mammalian cell was, <laughs> a dream that I don't think um, most people thought would be realized in there anytime soon. And now we can do this 200 million combination with endophenotypes that, that uh, can be upwards of uh, quite, quite, quite intensive outputs like transcript profiles, et cetera. And when you look at that, just to round off the area I'm most excited about, human genetics times functional genomics times this trillions of data points per experiment, this, this, this machine learning has the opportunity to deconstruct the, um, kind of the semantic representation behind all these data points. And so we think that really going deep on all three of these human genetics, functional genomics, and machine learning are what can allow us to elucidate targets that um, are novel and can uh, maybe uh, have a significantly higher probability of success than the, than the industry averages at present. I saw, Hal, uh, this week that you opened a, a center in, in London on the, on the machine learning <laughs> side, really speaks to that third leg. Yeah, we've, we've, we've tried to collaborate with the best and brightest. We have opened up the Laboratory for Genomics Research with its Jennifer Dowd, Jonathan Weissman, a center in, in San Francisco. We've got the machine learning group there as well, as well as the machine learning group now in, in London. And, uh, you know, we've got a collaboration with the Broad to do this variant to function assessment. So we're, we're trying to hire the best and work with the best and, and uh, you know, double down on that whole, that whole area and that technology. Very good, good, good luck. Matai, what about J&J? Uh, &J? Yeah, so Hal and I are thinking similarly in some ways here, but uh, you know, there, there is lots of opportunity for the use of data and analytics in what we're doing. There's um, on the, let, let me try a different kind of example, on the diagnostic side. So mm. when we talk about diseases that are really well known to most physicians coming out of their training, uh, they don't have a hard time identifying patients. As soon as you dip below a certain frequency of occurrence where it's unusual to see a patient with that condition or the condition just may not be known at all, it becomes extremely challenging. And mm -hmm. so um, as an example, we, have a, we treat a disease with a couple really effective agents for pulmonary arterial hypertension. And, um, but these patients are sometimes never diagnosed, or if they are diagnosed, are diagnosed in years, not yes. straight away. So what we're, what we're working on is a use of machine learning methods that are applied on top of data that are collected routinely. 
Like for example, electrocardiogram might be an example where in there is intuitively the data uh, to, to sort of diagnose something to do with, you know, your, your, how you're pumping blood. <laughs> and maybe there's a clue in there that you do in fact have some pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, so it's not a done deal, but it's an example of something where you can apply machine learning to immediately uh, do something that people can't naturally do. Like they, they're not, these are very subtle reads. Sometimes they're not uh, possible even with human eyes. But with these machine learning methods, especially applied to images and, and video, there's, there's the possibility of pulling back interpretation that's very difficult for humans. So in addition to the great work, some of what Hal referred to on choosing targets that make sense, the connection between a specific mechanism or path of, and, and, and a disease uh, pathophysiology, it's really important to say that machine learning methods data science broadly can be applied everywhere. And we're, we're fortunate to have uh, a great group under a great leader. Najat was on the previous panel, very pragmatic approach we've taken under her leadership to build up the, the data science uh, capability and application within Genesis. Marvelous, thank you, Matai. Andy, I, I must confess I've lost track of the collaborations, the joint ventures, and just seems to be hundreds that you've done since since taking over at Takeda, what, what's exciting? Well, I, I mean, not to restate what Matai and Hal have already agreed to, I'll just add a third leg to this idea of human genetics identifying strong targets, functional genomics allowing us to understand mechanism, and then this realistic toolbox of modalities that allow us to, to go after any disease target. You know, if we go back to when many of us joined the industry around 2000, you had small molecules in mice. And we succeeded. We cured every disease in mouse with small molecules. You know, congratulations. But unfortunately, we found a lot of that just didn't translate. And now we're at this juncture where realistically we could say that by the end of this century, we, we could have cured every known disease or managed every known disease. That, I don't think that's a fallacy. I think that that's a reality. But when I look at then the challenge, and then this is exciting, is what's going to get in our way? You know, yeah. Biology is still stochastic. It's not as as, as quantitative and precise as the physical sciences, but we can overcome that with mass action. What's gonna get in our way? Ourselves, our behaviors, our inability to control the landscape around us. You know, we talked a little bit earlier today about some of the shenanigans going on at FDA and some of the politicization of some of the, that could be brutal and, and yeah. delay significantly. We had same, same discussion earlier around pricing and not just pricing, but healthcare costs. If we can't get in front of that and own that, someone else will, and that has a chance to really disrupt our forward momentum. No, great, great points. And you're very kind, Andy, about when we joined the industry. How we'll enjoy this. I, I joined Beecham Pharmaceuticals in 1979. So you're, you're a little off with me. I'm sure the others what, are more contemporary. What, what modality were you using then? Leeches, Martin? Uh, believe it or not, <laughs> infectious diseases, earth samples, <laughs> Greening, you know, dead cells, live cells, and we made some medicines. It was amazing. David, a uh, question uh, for you on the, what's exciting. And then I'm going to go to the side to look at some questions from the audience in the last few minutes. David. Sure. Well, well let me pick up on the uh, couple threads that uh, the other panelists have started. One is the notion of, of data. And I would postulate, and we have a core belief that this is the century of human data from genomics and other omic technologies, so we're investing heavily in proteomics, uh, for example, through integration of these technologies in clinical trials to real-world data, data from the marketplace at the other end, but it all has one thing in common, it's human data uh, in a way that we haven't had before. How do we use that exploit that to understand and get a much more foundational understanding of human disease. Uh, so to us, we are trying to actually build an integrated unit, which remit is human data. Now, what that will do is, of course, give you new targets. And one of our challenges now is that about 80% of the targets of interest aren't currently tractable with current modalities. Uh, as Andy 
is pointing out. And so, you know, we have a very strong belief that, that one part of the future will be multi-specific or multifunctional. I'm reflecting on hearing Roy earlier today. He really was the avatar of the paradigm, single target, single drug, often an, uh, an enzyme that's inhibited or agonized by a drug. Well, how do we broach transcription factors, other hard to reach targets? Well, targeted protein degradation, other mechanisms where you have a binder and you have an effector and you bring those together to create new biology, uh, I think is just going to open up that universe of 80% of targets that we currently can't reach. So to me, that's tremendously excited, exciting. That gets us towards Andy's utopia where we can uh, go a long way uh, against a large swath of human diseases. Terrific. Let's go quickly to side and see if we can just get one question in from the audience. It might not be to every speaker, but side. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I think expanding on what uh, what what Hal started and, and then um, David talked about. I mean, I want to use uh, oncology as an example for emerging trends. And as David, you just pointed out, I mean, look at Keytruda becoming the first drug approved for a tumor agnostic indication like MSI high. And then other histology agnostic approvals followed for multiple tumor types. You got TRK fusion by Loxobayer, TRK fusion ROS1 by Genentech, and all the excitement around the development programs focused on KRAS mutations and other oncogenes. I mean, do you, I, know, I, I would love to hear from the panel, do you see this trend emerging in oncology to treat tumors based on common biomarker expressions rather than site of origin? And if, if that's the case, what are the implications for future oncology drug development strategies you know, for the right drug uh, to the right patient? I think we're, we're, we're pretty much out of time now, in, in truth. And it's such a great question that could uh, derive many answers. But do any of the panelists just want to jump in quickly? Is there anything that you would like to say? It's a great point, Saeed. Thank you. Sure, sure. I, 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 go ahead, Hal. I was just going to say, I think we're all probably vehemently agreeing that this uh, tumor agnostic approach is going to be uh, not only present in the future, but probably even more robust, where we use not just genomic biomarkers, but lots of different ways of deconstructing the pathophysiology of the tumor itself and thinking about ways of attacking it. My own personal belief is that that's going to become even more sophisticated, particularly with gene-gene interaction, the concept of synthetic lethality. So I, I, I know all of you pretty well. I imagine that that probably captures what everybody's thinking. This is a place to double down. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Marvelous. Thank you, Saeed, and, and thank you to the panelists. Terrific as always. We could we could spend a long time together, and normally we do after this and hang out and um, you know enjoy enjoy each other's company. But uh, really, many thanks indeed. I think I've got to uh, announce the poll results from the R and D question. Then I'm going to pass on to Andy. So, do we have a slide on that? Oh, there you go. Am I supposed to read that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd love to see that on a big screen. Can you see it clearly, Andy? You click on it and then you hit um, speaker view and that'll that'll light yeah. it up. Learn that oh, over. Man. I was clicking, just nothing was happening. My, my fingers have gone numb sitting <laughs> on the seat. So COVID-19 has led to an unprecedented level of collaboration among stakeholders in the biopharma industry. Where do you expect to see the biggest increase in collaborations post-pandemic? Uh, and the leader, it's only about a third is discovery preclinical, and then another third on clinical development, uh, manufacturing, you know, 20, 25%. And then interestingly, the lowest, the, the sharp end of comp yeah, competition, uh, uh, less than 6% on commercialization. So very interesting, and, and I must say, not too surprising. With that, again, thanks to the panel. I'm going to pass on to Andy now for some concluding remarks. Thank you, Andy.